Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. As we conclude our study, we'll go ahead and start in Hebrews 13, 1 through 4, uh, which starts out, Let love of the brothers and sisters continue. Do not neglect the hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are badly treated, since you yourselves are also in the, also are in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Before we actually get into the content of what is actually being taught in these four verses, it's important to notice that there is a transition that has taken place between this and the rest of the book. Most of the book of Hebrews has been concentrated on several different key themes that we've covered so far, uh, be it some of the connections between the Old and New Testament. Uh, it's written very much like a sermon, and that's probably the reason that you have a lot of preachers that really like this book because it's sort of written in that style. It's a rhetorical argument for most of the book. However, this last chapter is written much more like a personal letter. And that's one of the things that makes Hebrew so interesting is that some people even questioned whether or not it was actually an epistle because it starts out just going straight into uh, theological arguments, which is not a common thing of the epistles. We, we're very familiar with this, even if it's something brief. Normally, there is some form of introduction. Even Ephesians, which has probably the shortest introduction as far as like a personal greeting, that kind of thing, it does have it. Whereas Hebrew just, Hebrews just kind of starts right in the middle of the action. But one of the things that is a strong indication that this is not only a letter, but a letter to a specific group of Christians dealing with a specific problem and not just sort of a general treatise and a series of arguments, is this last chapter. And so uh, this chapter is very important to understand the context of the rest of the letter in the sense that it is directed at a specific group of Christians. There were specific problems that they were dealing with that the author is trying to address, and that this particular passage does belong in line with the rest of the epistle. Now, there are some scholars that will argue that originally Hebrews was just a sermon, and then chapter 13 was just sort of tacked on at the end. However, this is typically a strategy or a theory that is proposed and perpetuated by people that tend to be very skeptical of the authenticity of Scripture in general. The truth is there's no real reason for believing this is a later addition to the letter. Now, why it does not contain the sort of formal Hellenized uh, greeting that we're used to in other epistles at the beginning, we really have no idea. But the point is, the style, the word usage, the, uh, the phraseology that is used in chapter 13 is so similar to the rest that even though the content is very different than the rest of the book of Hebrews, there's really no question and no serious scholar that looks at the final chapter and says, yeah, that was probably added on later. The people that usually try to put that, that theory forward and try to uh, prove that that is the case, those are typically people that are looking for a reason to undermine the authority of Hebrews and try to say that it's not really an epistle and not, doesn't really belong in the Bible. But there's really no reason in the text itself to doubt that this was part of the original epistle. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the actual contents in these first four verses because you'll, you'll notice that as we read these first four ver verses, it sounds very much like what we're accustomed to that would happen at the end of an epistle. And this is true of Pauline epistles, and it's also true of Peter and John uh, when they write their epistles, is at the end they sort of start wrapping things up and just sort of give some general reminders, some, some tips for godly living that may be specific to the audience that they're dealing with at the moment, but it's a little bit more general probably than the rest of the epistle, which tends to be primarily concerned with one or two issues. And that's the case in Hebrews as well. And, and another reason why actually I think that the Hebrew author is actually Paul, because it sounds very Pauline, but you know, as we've discussed at length before, that's still up for debate. 
But nonetheless, uh, when it starts out, it uses this language of brotherhood, which we've seen repeated over and over in Hebrews. It, it is uh, an appeal to the familial bonds that Christians have with one another. So he's sort of encouraging them and using this as an addition for emphasis to say these are important things, brothers and sisters, I say this out of love. There might be some criticism here, but it's, it's aimed at improving the family of God. And that's what he's trying to uh, impart to them in the same way that you might say to your actual brother or sister, you know, when you're trying to get them to listen to you say brother or sister, you know, you, you might sort of give a little reminder of the bonds that you have between one another. And so then he goes into this, this general appeal for them to not neglect hospitality. I do think that it's important to note as well that if you note in verse 1, he talks about uh, let the love of brothers and sisters continue. So he doesn't say that this is something to be started up. He says this is something to be continued, which would imply that they were already doing this. And we've seen hints of this earlier in the book as well, but it's a good thing to point out, and I think that this is an important rule of thumb when we're talking to Christians in general, is that we want to acknowledge that there are things that they are doing well. And so before he gives them these sort of general tips about some things, maybe that they have some areas that they could work on or improve on, or maybe just even an encouragement to keep doing what they're doing, he is giving them some acknowledgement that they do have a love for their brothers and sisters, and he wants that to keep going. And so that's part of something that he's sort of, you know, extending an olive branch and saying, I may have been critical of you in some points, or I may have made some arguments that you find difficult to bear, but you know, we're still family. I acknowledge that you are continuing in the love of Christ. And so he's trying to give them something to say, you know, it's, it's not all bad. There's, there's a lot of things that y'all are doing well, and I want to acknowledge that. So he starts off with that. Um, and then he goes on with this love of brothers and sisters and then extends that to uh, hospitality to strangers and then talks about uh, being uh, remembering the prisoners and being mindful of them and then goes into uh, respect for marriage and one another's relationships. And so this seems to be a continuation of this theme of letting love continue. So these are things that he's acknowledging that they already do and he's just kind of encouraging them to continue on in that. Uh, we, al we already saw that he actually mentions in Hebrews 10.33 that they were extending sympathy to prisoners and they were very mindful of that. And so this seems to be a continuation of him not necessarily saying, hey, these are the things you have problems with. He kind of dealt with that earlier. In this section, it seems as though the author is saying, these are the things that you're already doing. Make sure you keep doing them. Just giving them a little bit of encouragement there. Uh, however, there was one thing that I thought was really interesting that we probably don't talk about very often, but I think it's a fascinating idea. So I'll just kind of put this question out to you. Do you think that Christians ever literally host angels? Does God send them as an opportunity to exercise hospitality? Okay, so apparently they did back then. Uh, it, it seems as though that is the case. We have no reason to believe that this particular passage of Scripture is not literal. So maybe I'll ex extend that. Do you believe that we continue to host angels? Do you think that that's something that God does now? Yeah, I appreciate you telling that, that personal story, and I also appreciate that you added a, a tale at the end. I don't know if that guy was actually an angel or not. Um, and I think that that's actually something that is alluded to in this verse, isn't it? It says that you have entertained angels without knowing it. So the implication is they have been hosting angels, at least from time to time, but a part of that was they were unaware of it. Now, would it have been impossible for that to have happened and then the angel to reveal to them that they are an angel? Maybe, but we certainly don't have any record of it. We have no biblical basis for believing that. And so I think it's very possible that Christians today may occasionally host angels or offer them some kind of kindness or benevolence or hospitality at some point. I don't know. But the point is, the fact that I don't know doesn't mean it doesn't happen because it seems what Paul, or sorry, what the Hebrew author is saying here is, you don't know either. So that's an interesting thing to think that perhaps we have at times hosted angels uh, in the literal sense. Um, we know that that has happened elsewhere in the scripture, just not in the New Testament. Uh, for example, Abraham and Lot both hosted angels in Genesis. You remember that uh, 
uh, they came to uh, Abraham and, and spoke to him and he offered them some food. There were three angels at that point. Uh, Lot did the same thing and then the whole thing with Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Gideon also hosted them in Judges 6, 11. Uh, and a somewhat lesser known when Manoah actually hosted angels a little later in Judges, in Judges 13, 3. And so this is something that actually does have biblical press, uh, a, a biblical background. Yes. Right, and I think that that's an excellent point as well. Um, regardless of whether it's done in the literal or not, it is an encouragement to extend hospitality to strangers because you don't know. And so the, the point is, this is the way you live and this is how you operate within the world whether there's angels or not, because I think God would be just as pleased with us if all of our hospitality were directed towards people that were actually just in need. Now, maybe he extends those opportunities to us in the form of sending angels on occasion, but whether he does or not, he's not going to tell us, so we just need to operate like it all the time. Uh, it's the same reason, I think, that God never tells us when the judgment is. I think that's pretty clear from the parables of Jesus Part of the rationale behind that is because we're just supposed to live like Jesus could come back at any minute. And so because of that, um, we're not given certain information because God wants to encourage us to good works for that specific reason. So, yeah, ec excellent point to bring up that the teaching is the same regardless of whether it's literally true or whether it's figurative. I think that it's literal. Um, but whether I do or not, my behavior remains unaltered. Um, so in verse 3, I think there's an interesting part that is brought up because he talks about being mindful of prisoners since you yourselves are also in the body. Now that's an interesting bit of symbolism there because for any of you that have had, for example, foot pain, you know that when you have foot pain, it doesn't stop in your feet. It, it goes up to your legs, it can go into your hips, your whole body can hurt because one part of your body is hurting. That's not always the case. Uh, but you know, if, if you get a pinched nerve in the right place or something, you may actually only have a problem with one part of your body, but the whole body feels pain as a part of that. And so there's this symbolism that is presented here that if the church is going to be the body of Christ, then when other brothers and sisters hurt, that pain should be felt by the rest of the body. We, we can't have a sort of apathy or indifference towards others in the, the congregation um, we, we can't do it just sort of that's not my problem sort of mentality. Uh, if the body of Christ is operating the way it is properly, then pain in one part of the body should be felt by the rest of the body. And it should also be used as a motivation to help, uh, you know, relieve that pain to some degree. And I think that that's one of the reasons that he's connecting it here with this sympathy that apparently the, the Christians he was writing to actually had been showing, as we saw earlier in the book of Hebrews that, um, you know, we, we may never have been in prison, but that doesn't mean that that's not a pain that we can't feel, and that's not a ministry that we can extend outwardly because even though we may not relate to that one specific circumstance, it could be us. And in the first century, I think that that was even more prevalent because they didn't have a First Amendment back in ancient Rome. And so they could have very well been taken off to prison merely for believing that Jesus is the Christ. And we're indicated by earlier portions of this book that in some cases that was literally happening. And so uh, I, this is a call to help prisoners specifically, but I think it's also sort of more of a general idea that Christians should be able to exercise empathy even if they have not been in that specific circumstance through the pain that they feel with other members of the body. Uh, verse 4 also is interesting, and I think it actually does tie into the earlier idea, even though it seems a little bit like it's changing subjects. Uh, ultimately, where it talks about marriage being held in honor, it's important for us to know that the church is God's most important institution. There are no caveats on that. The church is far more important than any other institution God gave mankind. However, keep in mind that marriage was the first institution. The church may be the greatest, but the marriage institution was the first actual institution that man was given by God. It precedes the law of Moses. It precedes everything else. And so there's something fundamental to the human nature to honor marriage and to respect it specifically because it is a gift and a blessing given directly by God. And I think that one of the things that it's speaking to here is, 
where it talks about being held in honor by all. Yes, marriage is a vertical institution in the sense that God gave it to mankind. And yes, we understand very quickly that it is a horizontal institution in the sense that a man and his wife have respect for the marriage towards one another. However, this is really not so much an encouragement to that specifically. I think that that's in there. But I think what this is primarily a call to is a call to everybody else to respect marriages between men and women. You know, I'm a single guy, obviously. That's not a secret. Um, I don't have a wife. But I still have to be aware of the fact that my Christian brothers and sisters are married. And I have to respect that, not just in the sense of not doing anything wrong, but also in the sense that there's going to be certain um, things that, that I might even have to sacrifice to make sure that that is held up in honor. And it's a conscientiousness between the brothers. I'll give a quick example here. Um, I have certain female Christian friends going all the way back to my college days. And I remember there was uh, one girl specifically um, that I was close with in 10th Street, uh, the church that I went to before I went here. And once she got married, we had to stop hanging out on a regular basis like we used to, not because we were doing anything wrong, but out of respect for what other people would say and out of respect for the institution and the commitment she had made to her husband, she didn't even want the appearance of anything, you know, bad going on, which obviously there was nothing, but uh, just because it was innocent doesn't mean that's how it would have been perceived by everyone else. And I can understand why some people without knowing any better, rumors could get started if they saw me and her, for example, eating dinner together at a restaurant. Would have been perfectly innocent. And her husband was away a lot because he was a military guy. But out of respect for her commitment to her husband, I decided it was the better, you know, discretion being the better part of valor. I would go out to eat with her and hang out, but only if there were other people around. It was never just me and her after she got married. And so that's just kind of one personal example from my own life. But the point is, even if you're not in the marriage itself, that institution is to be upheld and honored by all those that belong to the body of Christ. Uh, now, of course, the end of that is a warning for it to go even further. Of course, sexual immorality, adulterers, that kind of thing. But I'm saying even on the, the surface level, that institution has to be honored, even by those that are not actually engaged within it. Uh, let's look at verses 5 through 7. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever abandon you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? So it's interesting in verse 5, this is an exact translation uh, of the, the word there saying free from the love of money. The actual exact translation of the Greek phrase would be covetousness. And I think that that's fascinating because I don't think we talk about covetousness much in our, uh, I don't hear a lot of sermons about that. Um, I wouldn't say that we ignore it, but we certainly don't talk about it very often. Uh, yet, I think it's very clear that the Bible talks about this here and in multiple other occasions, that covetousness is the enemy of contentment. And I think that the reason for that is because it's an inward focus and it's a comparative focus. You know, one of the, I, I think this is a fantastic movie called The Ultimate Gift. And I don't want to ruin the whole thing for you if you've never seen it, but it's a really good film. I recommend it if you have not seen it. And it's about a young man who is extremely wealthy and he's a trust fund baby, had money his entire life. And his rich relative who's sort of the, um, patriarch of his entire family and the reason his family is wealthy, he actually puts him through a series of trials after he dies in order to gain his inheritance. So that's the plot of the movie. And at one point, he is talking to his friend that he's made over the course of this movie, and he says to her, who's, who's not a wealthy person, he says, you don't understand. Money is not just having things. It's security. It's a way of life. And what he means by that, I think, is, is a truism about people. And keep in mind that we as Americans are richer than any human beings have been for 99% of human history. So we fall into that in a lot of ways as well. 
when you do have a lot of worldly possessions, that's where you tend to put your faith. You tend to believe that you are secure because of the wealth that you've accumulated. You tend to believe that your family is going to be provided for because of that. Poor people don't have that luxury, and I think that that's one of the primary reasons that a running theme of Jesus' ministry is that uh, the poor are, in some ways, having some advantages over the rich, which was not the common thought process of people living in that era. They believed that if you're wealthy, it meant you were blessed by God, and so you must be doing all right in God's sight. But Jesus kind of flips that on his head and says, actually, rich people, they're not like, it's not necessarily evil to be rich, but you do have a lot of extra temptations that poor people don't. Poor people have to be more reliant upon God. They have to uh, be more aware of the fact that they are dependent on him. And so because of that, they have certain advantages there. And so where he says, be free from the love of money or to be free from covetousness, I think what he's really trying to say there, where he says, he adds that little addendum in the middle of the the sentence, be content with what you have. The way to avoid the sin of covetousness is to just be content with what you've got. Because if you have that, then you're not going to be comparing yourself to other people. You're not going to be wanting things that other people have because what you have is sufficient. And I think it, that's a very simple thing, but it's something that we need to remind ourselves of, and I think that the Hebrew author acknowledges that. Uh, also, the quotation here that you see in the verse where he's talking about, I will never forgive you nor forsake you, uh, that quote is actually from Joshua 1.5, and it's the same kind of idea. Um, th- this, when this is happening... You have to remember that Moses was the forerunner. There was no prophet really before Moses. He's the first one. And he's been Israel's leader ever since the beginning of the Exodus. And so this transition that's taking place between Moses and Joshua would have been one that, first of all, the readers who were Jewish would have been very familiar with. And they remember this episode as the time where Israel goes from just being delivered by God out of Egypt and being led by him around in the desert to actually having to do something, actually having to put their faith to the test against other opposing armies to go in and conquer and take the land of Canaan. And so in the same sense that the people that he's writing to, remember, are displaced, they feel like they don't have a home, they're wanderers, they have been largely rejected from not only the pagan community, but also the Jewish community as well. And so they kind of feel this displacement in this, we don't really have a home. And so in the same sense that he's saying, being content with what you have, uh, let your character be free, free from covetousness, that same line of thinking is, put your faith in God. You're correct to assume, because we see it happening in real time here, that the people that he's speaking to are being persecuted. They don't have a lot to depend on around them. He's saying, let God be the source of your faith in the same way that the Israelites were kind of in a similar situation in the time that they went into the conquest of Canaan. Let your contentment be with him because him you do have. You may not have a lot of worldly possessions. You may be in bad straits, but you do have God and be content in him. That's really the message that he's getting to. Now, this other quote is actually directly taken from Psalm 118. And we'll go ahead and read verses 5 through 9 to put it in context. For my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and put me in an open space. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in noblemen. And so you can see from the context of this psalm why this was included in this particular passage of Scripture. Well, in these few verses where the theme is, don't put your faith in money or other people or your sense of community with the Jews or any of that stuff. Your faith should be in God and God alone. You should be content with Him. And then he cites this psalm where if you're looking at it, that's exactly what this psalm is talking about. He's saying, don't be afraid. If God is on your side, you don't have to worry about that stuff because he's going to take care of you. And so that's really the running theme that is going through these few verses. And the quotation of Psalm 118 is very appropriate for exactly that reason. So let's go ahead and look at verses 7 through 9. 
Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their way of life, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be misled by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by fools, through, uh, through though which those who were so occupied were not benefited. So a couple of quick things on the Greek part of uh, verse 7 here. The Greek word for result that gets translated into the result of their life, uh, it, the Greek word is ekabasis, which means the way out or the ending. So the implication here is that the people that he's talking about have already died. Now, maybe these were people that were members of the apostles. Maybe these were people that were sort of the first generation Christians that had actually seen Jesus and spoken to him. But regardless, these were faithful Christians that these people had looked up to. And this is part of the reason that I think that it was probably addressed to Jerusalem. But, you know, that's a, a side discussion. Um, but whatever group that he's talking about that he wants them to emulate, these are probably Christians that have already died based on the context and based on the Greek word there. And then the second Greek word I want to talk about where he says, considering the result, consider uh, anathiorontes means to look back upon. And so he's talking about reflection. So when he, he talks about imitating their life, he's talking about that they're looking back on their life as though it's already been completed. So that's a very strong indication that the people that he's talking about, that he's encouraging them to emulate, are probably people that have already died. And it is also possible, and I would say strongly suggestive, that if you remember earlier in the passages that we were looking at last week, he talks about you have not yet suffered to the point of shedding blood. And then later he brings up this group of people that are no longer with them people that were very faithful. Now, there's some guesswork going on here, I have to admit. But this could very well be talking about the same group. It is possible the group he is talking about are people that are dead because they were martyred. Maybe there's a mix of those. Maybe he's talking about faithful Christians that died of natural causes and those that are martyred. But it seems to me that that's what he's talking about. And so, in the same way that an Old Testament writer would make a call back to Israel, be like the people of this generation that took the promised land, or be like the people of this generation, or the mighty men of David who uh, you know, chased out the Philistines, or, or calling back to Bible heroes, he's connecting the two. So now, it's not just, I'm going to reference all these Old Testament heroes that you revere, even though he does that earlier as well, but also... There are Bible heroes that you knew. There are Bible heroes, men of great faith and valor, that have already passed on that you need to emulate now. So there's definitely Bible heroes of the past in the Old Testament, but there's also Christians that are, that are in that same lineage. And so very much like an Old Testament writer, he esteems them, go and be like these heroes that you knew and who were influential to your faith so that you may live faithfully the way that they did. Um, and then verse 8, um, he's talking about Jesus being the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's saying, look, the same Jesus that gave them strength, the same Jesus that they put their faith in, and that they were faithful unto death, that's the same Jesus that you have in your corner too. So don't think that you can't do this, or that it's too difficult, or you need to turn back, because they didn't turn back, and that's the same Jesus that encouraged them that can now encourage you. You have the same Savior, He didn't change, He's not less powerful now. And so if they could do it, you have the same resources made available to you. Now in verse 9, he talks about and sort of contrast with the faithful Christians who were faithful unto death and influenced their faith with those who are doing what he calls strange teaching. Um, and it's important that the word here does not mean new teaching, but rather different than sound doctrine. Uh, it could be a number of different things. We've already sort of speculated at some of the groups that, it, it, that may have been uh, proposed here. Possibly the Judaizers, which would have been common in, if it's a congregation of people that are, you know, mostly Jews. Uh, 
that there'd be people that we see like from Galatians or the book of Acts that are trying to bring Old Testament stuff into the New Testament. Very well could have been that group. Could have been some other form of heresy. But either way, we have people that are not teaching sound doctrine that these people are aware of, maybe in close proximity to. And he's contrasting those people who have left the faith or have left sound teaching um, and are trying to put their faith in things like foods, which is mentioned in verse 9, which I think is a very strong indication these are are Jews that are trying to bring in Jewish dietary laws into Christianity. Could be something else, but just based on the context, it's most likely that. So he's saying, don't be like them and don't be led astray by their strange teachings. Hold fast to the gospel that we have taught you, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the same ones that, uh, the same gospel that your heroes, the people that influenced your faith, held to as well. So let's go ahead and read verses 10 through 14. We have an altar from which those serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, for their bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate. He might sanctify the people, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. So then, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. So we already know what the altar is. That was something that was discussed earlier in the book. Um, but who are those who serve the tabernacle? Right, the priest. So the Levitical priest under the old law of Moses. Now, of course, in this particular era of history, they didn't have a tabernacle. They had a temple. But the point is there were, uh, just like the tabernacle would have been in the Old Testament, they had the Levit- Levitical priesthood that was serving in the temple in this era. And so the Levitical priest, and then by extension, the Jews as well, those were the ones that were serving at the altar of the tabernacle. We have a different altar in our tabernacle, as was addressed earlier. But he's saying the ones who serve at the tabernacle in Jerusalem, they have no right to eat of the sacrifice that we partake of. And so he's drawing a contrast there. He says, if you think Judaism is enough, that you can just fall back into Judaism and be right in the eyes of God, no. No. They have no share in the inheritance that we have. They do not eat the same food that we eat. They are a different group. And God is no longer satisfied with that and that alone. Jesus is the only way to the Father at this point in history. And so that was just sort of a reaffirming of what he's already been talking about for the majority of the book. And then he starts talking about a offering being made outside the camp. This is a direct reference to what happened on the Day of Atonement, which of course has been a running theme throughout this book. Um, And this is the only sacrifice where the priest did not eat at least a portion of the sacrifice. So in every sacrifice that you're looking at in the Old Testament, uh, and this goes back to Leviticus 16.27, that was the one sacrifice a year that the priest did not get any of the sacrifice. All of that sacrifice was to go to God. And so um, when they would not eat of that sacrifice, he's saying in the same way that they have no part in that sacrifice Uh, they have no part in the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement either, and so they don't eat of that sacrifice. Unlike us, who have the perfect Lamb of God and partake in that sacrifice through His his body, which is representative in the bread, His blood, which is represented in the fruit of the vine. Um, And it's interesting that he notes that it was taken outside of the camp for that to happen. Where was Jesus sacrificed? Outside of Jerusalem. He sacrificed in Gethsemane on a hill overlooking Jerusalem. He's not actually within the city when that happens. And so he kind of gives this analogy of, um, you know, you guys are deathly afraid of being kicked out of the community, of no longer being part of Jerusalem, being part of uh, the community that you're in, but you forget that your Savior was also cast out of the city. And that's where the sacrifice had to take place. And that was tied into and symbolic of the sacrifice that took place on the Day of Atonement. And so it has to be taken out of the city uh, for that to take place in the same way that you no longer, you know, you may not be as intimately involved with the community that you used to be. Remember that if you do that, and if you're no longer part of that community in the way you used to be, that Jesus wasn't either. That's why they took him out of the city and crucified him there. 
And so uh, just drawing sort of a symbolic parallel there. Um, verse 13 talks about uh, going outside the camp with him and that being really kind of what it, he's encouraging them to do, saying that in the same way that he bore the reproach of being cast out of his community, we bear that same reproach, and that's actually a good thing because we're following in Christ's spiritual footsteps. Uh, he makes a clean break from the community there. Uh, and then in verse 14, where he talks about having a, not having a lasting city, but we are to seek a city which is to come. That's very much reminiscent of the language that we saw in chapter 11. You remember where he talks about Abraham being a pilgrim and being cast out from his home and, and following God wherever he may lead. And it talks about all these great Bible heroes being wanderers. And so this is sort of a direct reflection of that same language, which, by the way, side note, one more indication that verse 13 is not something that is added later because it's using the same symbolism that he was earlier in the same book. Um, so in the same way that uh, Abraham had to leave his father's home or that Moses left the comforts of Egypt, that Jesus also left his community and was taken outside to be crucified. And in the same way, you may have to give up your community in order to follow God correctly as well. And so there's a similarity being spoken of there. Let's look at verses... Uh, 15 through 17. Uh, through him then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips, praising his name. And do not neglect doing, and sharing, doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so, they, uh, so that they may do this with joy not groaning, for this would be unhelpful to you. If our sacrifice and our kingdom are spiritual, which verse 15 clearly says that it is, then that means our offerings, our praises to God have to be of a spiritual nature too. It's not enough just to say it. The fruit of our lips has to come from the heart. And so in the same way that we have moved from the physical sacrifices and offerings of the Old Testament to the spiritual offerings, the same thing is being required of us here as well. Um, there is a spiritual sacrifice, but as verse 16 would point out, yes, it is spiritual, but there are physical, tangible, real-world results. So our offerings and our praises to God may be spiritual in the sense that we don't have to sacrifice an animal and then burn it in a physical way to give up offerings to God. However, that does not change the fact that we are still expected to do good, that we are to take care of one another, that we are to be our brother's keeper, and that we're to look out for uh, our fellow Christians and also the, com the human community as a whole. That is something that we are obligated to do. And so it's, that section has kind of ended up with, and with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Uh, verse 17 includes an encouragement to follow the new church leaders. Um, and also kind of a warning as well. I think that there's sort of a symbiotic, uh, symbiotic relationship that is being alluded to here. So he talks about obeying your leaders and submitting to them. Um, and, to the, and he also is kind of alluding to the fact that we need to be good followers as well. But there's also a warning included for, for elders and church leaders as well because he says that they're going to have to give an account. And so uh, in both senses, we're supposed to be working together to make each other's jobs easier. The members are supposed to be doing the best that they can to be good followers, to not make the job of church leadership a drudgery or something that's difficult for them to do. And in the same way, uh, they are to, to us, remember that they have to give an account for our souls. And so because of that, there is an encouragement to them to remember that, you know, you, you have a great position of authority and something that is to be honored. But at the same time, that means you got extra responsibility and extra, extra things that you have to give account for. And so there's this sort of uh, symbiotic relationship like a family where we're supposed to be helping one another and encouraging one another to be able to do God's work. Uh, verses... 18 through 21, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things, and I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you more quickly. Now, may the God of peace, who brought 
up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, that is, Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now there's some interesting word choices here I want to take your attention to. First of all, he says, pray for us. Who is us? It's obviously second person, which means that whoever is writing this, it's not just him, it's a group. Now, that this could lend credence to the idea that we discussed in our introduction, that this epistle is written by committee. In other words, it doesn't have one author. It's maybe two or three different people. I don't think that that's necessarily the case because he has used the first person before. So uh, I think what he's talking about is there is a group of elders or maybe it's written by an apostle. And then further on in that same verse, he talks about, or not in that same verse, but uh, later on in that same passage, he talks about that I will be restored to you, which would suggest that whoever is writing this is probably in prison. Now, let's see, who could have possibly lived in Rome that was imprisoned and was an apostle? Again, it's not a sure thing, but I think this is a pretty good indication we're talking about Paul here. Um, could be wrong, but I think that that's the case. I don't mean to beat that dead horse, I'm just saying. Right, and th this passage alludes to that too. Yeah, that, that Paul was always asking people to pray for him, and so that's something that was very consistent with the other Pauline letters. So very quickly, we'll, we'll end up here with the last few verses. Uh, let's see, 22 through 24. But I urge you, brothers and sisters, listen patiently to this word of exhortation, for I have written you briefly. Know that our brother Timothy has been released with you, whom, if he comes, I will see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Yeah, I wonder who else was a traveling companion of Timothy. I'm sorry, I promised I'm not going to beat that dead horse anymore, but... Come on, guys, it was totally Paul. Anyway, uh, so in verse 22, there is a mark of Scripture that he desires them to hold to it. And it also suggests to us that Timothy was imprisoned himself, which is interesting, something that we don't really have record of anywhere else in Scripture. Uh, however, the ending of this, I think, is an indication of the whole of the book, which first, the letter seems to originate from Rome. But the encouragement, he says that this is a word of exhortation and he's giving them a little bit of encouragement that he wants to see them soon. Ultimately, I think that the thrust of this entire book has been hold on to Christ and never let him go. No matter what. No matter what the social pressures are, no matter what your background is or what trepidations or hang-ups that you may be having, hang on to Christ and never let him go for any reason. That is the theme of the entire book of Hebrews. And if you got nothing else out of the class and got that out of it, I think that it's been well worth your time. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this class and I appreciate your attention. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.